Hey everyone, fantastic to see you here. So let's see who we got. Hey Tim, hi Isabel, lovely to see you. Oh, who else? It's quite oh, oh there's loads of you. And Dolores, lovely to see you here. Michael, Tim, Jeff. No, I don't know. There's because we've got lots of Jeffs. So um, just let me know that you can hear me because that's always a good start. I don't know why I'm freezing up. Um, yay, hi Dave. Uh, so tonight we're going to be covering the controversial topic of reversing diabetes. Um, hi Dolores uh, and Jeffrey. So we've got Jeff and Jeffrey. Jeff probably you only get called Jeffrey when you're in trouble. Hi Tony. Um, thanks for the heads up about um, signal and things. It um, yeah we're on fast signal, but sometimes apparently I sound like a Dalek. Uh, hi, Alan. Great to see you. Looking forward to talking to you tomorrow. Oh, and Lorna. Yeah, I hope you got my message. Um, so, lovely people, we're going to be talking about the controversial topic of reversing. Now, why I call it controversial is that there are so many people out there who believe it's not possible. And when you mention it, they think that you're selling snake oil. Uh, and even to the people that have signed up to get my emails, when I mention reversing, um, and I sent an email out a couple of days ago saying I'm, you know, it's a bit scary talking about reversing because whenever I send out an email about reversing, I get emails back from people going, "Rah, you're a, you're a, not an ethical person, and you're, you know, and they're not happy." Um, and that is because you are told by lots of doctors, and you know, uh, in the chat box, guys, let me know. I mean, how many people have told you that it's impossible to reverse type two diabetes? I bet most of you have heard it or been told it or even been told it by your doctor. Um, so, hey, Isabel. So, um, so yeah, I'm usually uh, pretty careful about talking about it, so I'm talking about it privately with you guys. Uh, because there's actually very clear evidence. And some of you sitting here watching this, when I first met you had diabetes and now don't have diabetes. Uh, and I'm looking at you, Dave, and there's quite a few of you actually. And there's a few in the next group. I sent a lovely newsletter out today with some before and after photos of Anita, who is totally non-diabetic now. Her HbA1c is below 40. Woohoo, go Anita. Um, so it gets told, you know, you, it gets talked about a lot when in actual fact the evidence is very clear. Uh, and not only in one study have they been able to reverse type 2 diabetes, they've been able to reverse it in a number of different studies coming from different perspectives. Uh, the main one that you will have all heard of that I'm running a course on at the moment is the Newcastle study, the Newcastle protocol that used a very low calorie diet to reverse diabetes. The first set and this, all of the studies done in Newcastle were funded by Diabetes UK. Now it's a charity, it hands out its money very begrudgingly and it gave 2.4 million pounds for the initial study and towards some of the follow-up studies. Uh, and it's the most money that they've ever given or given for clinical studies. So this is, um, yeah. uh, so Isabel is just saying, sorry, we're just, I'm gonna interrupt for a news flash. Isabel says she met up with her diabetic nurse yesterday and she's over the moon at uh, Isabel's weight loss and her blood pressure is well down. Fantastic. Um, and Isabel's going to her GP for her checkup in two weeks. Yeah, because I got an email from somebody else today who's usually on the next call who said he's been declared non-diabetic as well. Woohoo! I get some lovely, I know I talk about getting scary emails, but I get much more lovely ones than I do scary ones. And usually they're not trying to be mean to me, they just, yeah, if you've been told you can't reverse it and then someone comes along and says you can, um, it can take a while for that to sink in. And, um, and they tell me I'm crazy. Um, so the Newcastle protocol was based on the premise of um, actually gastric bypass surgery. So Professor Taylor, and it's a well-known phenomenon, had noticed that people that undergo 
bypass surgery and particularly gastric bypass so that's where they aren't putting the band around the stomach they actually remove a portion of the stomach so they make the stomach much smaller they staple the stomach you lose some of your intestines as well um, and those people um, that were type 2 diabetic within a few weeks of the surgery they go back to being non-diabetic and the premise was that there was some metabolically active part of the stomach they were removing that was changing the hormones uh, and uh, the metabolism that was reversing the type 2 diabetes. Um, Professor Taylor, um, sorry, I'm just going to interrupt because I've got lovely people. So I've got Jeff and Jeffrey. So Jeff says it's completely traceable. He said uh, he was 42 and he he's 42 now and he was 48. Jeffrey says his HbA ones and you'll notice different numbers because we're transitioning. So sometimes we talk about 5.1 and sometimes we talk about 40 and 45s. Um, Wow. So his HbA1c was a 5.1. However, okay. So fine. So Jeffrey's using a different word, which is great. He's saying his um, OGTT peaked at 17.1, but he's in remission rather than cured. If I go back to my old diet, then I'll be diabetic again. You're absolutely right. You know, reverse remission. Um, both mean you're symptomless, but if you go back to what you did before, you will go back to what you had before. Um, Dolores is saying, one of my doctors told me that even if I came off all my diabetic medications, I would still be diabetic. I told him that I choose to believe my Mary Kemp and that my diabetes would actually be reversed. Now, Dolores and Jeffrey are both right. Uh, you can reverse your type 2 diabetes, but if you go back to a diet that's heavy in carbohydrates, your insulin levels will go up, the insulin resistance will return, and you will go back to being diabetic again. Now, I will talk about that because this is an aspect that they looked at in the study at the Newcastle regime. So they looked at what happened afterwards, and they found that people that didn't modify their diet afterwards went back to becoming diabetic. Um, but people that did stayed diabetes-free. And, you know, it's... Kind of, it makes sense. It's common sense. Um, Lorna says, unfortunately, if it is true that even if we are no longer diabetic, we're still diabetic for insurance. But, oh, wow, that's really mean. So Lorna's saying, unfortunately, it is true that even if we are no longer diabetic, we're still diabetic for insurance purposes and for health checks, I've been told. Now, uh, I will um, investigate that, Lorna, because there is a diabetic register. Uh, and um, the GP can put you on that and he can also remove you from that. So I'm not sure how that stands with your insurance company. When it comes to insurance, um, don't miss anything out because they try and get through every little loophole. Uh, they're horrendous. So you would need to declare that you are not on medication at the moment, um, but you have been diabetic. Um, yeah. So Lorna's saying she's been told that that's the case. Uh, and Lorna says they were told that at the Desmond course. It's really tricky when it comes to insurance purposes. The insurance companies have a big backside that they like to cover and they'll do it at your expense. Uh, so unfortunately, um, being diabetic does have other stings in the tail. Like if you're trying to travel, you're trying to get health insurance. They do, of course, take that opportunity to make your life a little bit more difficult. Uh, but there's other benefits, obviously, of not being diabetic that extend far for past insurance. So things like driving licenses and all those kind of things become easier um, when you're non-diabetic. So, yeah, uh, the world is a complicated place when it comes to health conditions and how people like to approach them. So um, in the study, um, Prof Taylor, so going back to the gastric bypass, the uh, radical gastric surgery, they were thinking that there was some metabolic uh, pathway that was being interrupted that was causing the type 2 diabetes to reverse. Um, and prof, prof, <clears throat> got my water. Professor Taylor thought, 
what do all of these patients have in common? And what they all have in common is rapid weight loss. Uh, so he kind of, he had an alternative hypothesis that what if it's the rapid weight loss that's causing the reversal rather than any underlying metabolic pathway. So that's what the study was designed to replicate. It was designed to replicate what happens after extreme gastric bypass. And they used a very low calorie diet to do that. <clears throat> now what they're wanting to do, sorry, I've, I'm nearly better. I've nearly got over my cold, but it doesn't like me talking too much. Um, so <clears throat> what they did was design a very low calorie diet that contains 100% of the nutrition that you need on a daily basis, but is deficient in calories. So the body is forced to use the fat stores for calories. Now, if they could have made it zero calorie, they would have. But the issue with your fat stores is that they're pure energy and they contain no other nutrients, no vitamins, no minerals. You do need a little bit of protein on a daily basis. Uh, so none of the other requirements. So they replaced that with uh, meal replacements. Um, and they were having 600 calories a day and some green vegetables. So quite closely mimicking what would happen after gastric bypass. Uh, the first study they did was a pilot study. So pilot means that before they throw loads of money at it, they're going to put a small number of people through the protocol in the study and check out if the hypothesis is actually true. So they only put 11 people through the study. Um, and uh, they'd all been diagnosed for less than three years. So that's classed as newly diagnosed. Uh, and in those... Um, patients, uh, the diabetes was what they called 100% reverse within the eight weeks. So some people reversed earlier than that, um, but it took a maximum of eight weeks to reverse diabetes in 100% of those people. Now, four of them did return to their old patterns of eating and got had issues with their blood sugars as a result. Seven of them maintained some changes and have stayed diabetes free. Now, there's been two other studies done since then, um, one uh, with more people, uh, and they were able to reverse it in people that had had diabetes up to 10 years, and they've also reversed it in someone that's had diabetes up to 23 years. But what they know is that the longer you've been diabetic, the um, more entrenched the insulin resistance is. So, it, you know, if, if you've been diabetic for a long time, you might not completely reverse it, but you will see a massive improvement in your condition. So, for example, I know one lovely person who's lost a lot of weight, has done fantastically. The blood sugars are in the normal range, but their body can only tolerate a small amount of carbohydrates. So if they eat a slice of cake, their blood sugars do go up a little bit higher. They come back down again, but they go up. Uh, so they're not tolerant of carbohydrates and their tolerance hasn't increased. So they're going to be fine, but they're going to have to live at that level of carbohydrates. And the person I'm talking about is not alone in that. Some of you may have heard, uh, about, and I highly recommend you look him up, Tim Noakes, Professor Tim Noakes, N-O-A-K-E-S. He's absolutely amazing and one of the big... Um, figures in the low carb diabetes world. He's actually type 2 diabetic himself. His father died of type 2 diabetes um, and he completely turned his world on his head. He was um, a very highly regarded A-rated researcher. That is uh, quite hard to do. Um, and uh, he's South African, works with the Springboks and uh, Olympic athletes out there that was his job. He was in, um, and actually I've got, I've interviewed him. I've been lucky enough to interview him. Uh, and so he wrote the Bible on running. He's an ultra marathon runner and uh, never particularly overweight, but believed in carb loading. That was his thing, carbs all the way. Uh, and um, that was his platform. Now in his, must have been late 50s, he realized he was type 2 diabetic. He was a little bit overweight, but we're talking a few kilos, uh, you know, a stone maximum. Uh, and he then discovered low carbing 
and um, completely um, changed his opinion. So he stood up and he did what most doctors will never ever do. He stood up and he said, I was wrong. All of my uh, information and evidence I've been giving you was wrong. I'm very sorry. Um, this is what you should be doing. Uh, now, he's a fit guy. He's um, a big guy, tall guy, not particularly overweight, and he can only handle 25 grams of carbs a day. He told me if he goes over 25 grams, his sugars start to go up, his triglycerides go up, and his body doesn't cope very well. So, you know, sometimes uh, the carbohydrate intolerance does stay with you. Uh, Lorna was saying, Mary, I would like your opinion on whether it has to be a rapid weight loss to affect your diabetes reversal or whether if you lose the same amount of weight but over a longer time scale, is it more likely to be successful? Do we know the answer to that one? That's a very good question. Um, basically, what we're trying to do and what Roy, Te Roy, I always want to call him Roy, I get Professor Teller because Rob Roy, I always get them confused. Sorry, um, I'm saying sorry to Professor Taylor. Um, I will remember his first name. Um, is that it's the buildup of fat in the liver and the pancreas that causes the metabolic problems. So, and some people can be healthy weight and still have type 2 diabetes, and that is because they've got a buildup of fat in the liver and the pancreas. So, the rapid weight loss. Uh, is caused by calorie restriction. So it's not the rapid weight loss itself, it's that the body has to find the fuel from somewhere to uh, to live, to survive. To, you know, women on average need about 2,000 calories a day, men need about two and a half thousand. If you're not taking enough in, you've got your, you know, your supermarket stored on your body and the body breaks into the supermarket and uses that stored energy. So all it's about is forcing the body to use that stored energy because it uses um, the fat that is stored improperly, if you like, first. So we're not meant to store fat in our liver and our pancreas. The body puts it there when it's run out of other storage places. So some people can be very overweight and not be type 2 diabetic, and that's just because genetically they have more allocated storage for fat. Some people can be, you know, a tiny and you know completely healthy weight and this is very common amongst the asian community uh, and have diabetes and that is because they have much genetically just less storage space uh, around their body for the fat so it starts getting stored in the organs the liver and the pancreas so each one of you and this is a, a term that professor taylor coined has a personal fat threshold it's genetically set in your liver when you go over that, you start having metabolic problems, you'll start becoming insulin resistant, you will start, uh, you will become diabetic. So the calorie restriction isn't about the rapid weight loss, it's about forcing the body to burn those fat stores, to empty the liver and to empty the pancreas. And the fastest way of doing that is through calorie restriction, so very low calorie diet. The fastest food way of doing it is low carb high fat so carbohydrates the diet high in carbohydrates is complicit in filling the liver with fat and um, putting it in the pancreas as well um, you drop the carbohydrates um, moderate protein high fat and that empties the liver much faster and that's well known so they have compared um, what happens with insulin resistance and what happens with fat levels in the liver and the pancreas on different dietary approaches. So uh, low fat, you know, watching calories compared to high fat, low carb, and low carb empties the liver much, much faster. So that's the fastest food way of doing it. Um, rapid weight loss versus slow weight loss isn't uh, a big difference because the only way you can lose weight is by dropping your insulin levels. Insulin is the key hormone here. It is your fat storage hormone. It's nearly impossible to lose weight with high levels of insulin. And some of you watching this may have been 
you know, are still or were injecting insulin. And as soon as you start injecting insulin, you don't change what you eat, but your weight starts to pile on. Um, insulin is weight gain, it's fat storage. So if you are losing weight, it means you're dropping your insulin levels down uh, and you're forced into burning your fat stores. So it's kind of more fast or slow, which way do you want to go? Some people like to take the fast route because it's done. Some people like to go slow and steady and you, know, you don't need to do one or the other. You can, you know, some people will do a short burst of the very low calorie diet and then transition onto low carb high fat and that is the key whatever you do so if you decide to do a very low calorie diet you still need to transition onto low carb high fat because otherwise you'll undo what you've achieved so it's very important about lifestyle change ah lorna saying it is roy yay I thought it's Roy. Thank you, Lorna. Um, so Jeff says, I've never asked, do you or, <clears throat> or have you ever had diabetes? Um, or was it your pop who instigated your interest in the condition? Yeah, I haven't had diabetes. We, um, My family clearly has insulin resistance in the family. Sorry, water again. I promise it's water. They were teasing me. It was gin yesterday. Um... So this is, well, not where it gets complicated. So <clears throat> if you're sitting there and you've got type 2 diabetes, actually give yourself a little pat on the back because you have got the best version of insulin resistance there is. So high insulin is toxic, causes a lot of damage. Um, type 2 diabetes is the friendliest one of them all because you can reverse it. You can turn it around. Your body's giving you time. Now, the other side of the coin for insulin resistance is um, cancer and unfortunately heart disease uh, so my family has going right back obviously very big problems with insulin resistance um, with terrible heart disease going through my family so my great grandmother died it because for women women are protected by our hormones until we hit menopause once we hit menopause our risk of heart disease and all the other nasty stuff goes to the same as men or higher so um, she died in her early 50s, suddenly, no warning. Um, my uncles, so my dad and my uncles have both had triple and quadruple heart bypasses. And uh, my other uncle had heart problems, but cancer got him first. Uh, and my dad is on dialysis at the moment. So, um, and then I've got other family members that have type 2 diabetes. Um, so there's kind of a, a long history. So, uh, and I feel really angry at the injustice of it all. Like I was speaking to someone today and I said to her, look, please don't be upset if you hear me say this. Because um, she went in to see her doctor and was diagnosed with um, diabetes. And then she went to see the diabetes nurse. And she said, the first thing the diabetes nurse says, well, we've got you for life now, haven't we? She's like, oh, why, why? no, hopefully not. And uh, and she was told that she needed to attend the Desmond course. Now we know that the Dem Desmond course tries, but fails. And actually, don't take my word for that. They have studied it, um, and they've shown that after twelve months, there is no benefit. So all the money they're spending, there is absolutely no benefit to the Desmond course. It doesn't alter people's uh, trajectory in type two diabetes. Um, but she was also, it was subtly suggested because she wasn't keen on doing the Desmond course. And she was told that if she didn't attend, they could decide to withdraw care. And she said she didn't know how serious they were, but she went to the course. <laughs> um, so just that, just treating it like it's a trivial condition when it's really not. And treating it like it's normal when it's really not and not giving you the most recent information I started to get a bit annoyed about that so um yeah it's a bit, a bit of a personal crusade maybe um so Dave is saying I started on the very low calorie diet but only did it for a short time and now he's high fat low carb now Dave has very kindly in the past shared his story um, and he started on insulin and came off it very quickly on the very low calorie diet and is now non-diabetic on the high fat, low carb diet. Um, hi, Dave. 
Uh, so Ruth says, for weight loss, you recommend low carbs and high fat, but without high protein, hunger is unbearable. However, you warned that high protein was dangerous. So what are you supposed to do? Would welcome your advice on this. Thank you, Ruth. Um, usually fat is uh, the most, um, well, it gives you the most satiety, fills you up the most, is the hardest thing to digest. So that's where the high fat comes in. Now, if you're finding that the fat isn't filling you up and you need high protein, uh, and Ruth, I don't know how long you followed it for because it can take um, a little while and sometimes six to 12 weeks for your fat metabolism to really kick into gear because you haven't been using it for years. You've been running on carbs. So when you run on fats, fat, that engine stutters a little bit. It, uh, the metabolic pathways aren't set up. So it takes a while to get running. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that can be the problem. Now, high protein is obviously a lot better than high carbs. So what you might want to try with is starting out at high protein and getting yourself up and running and then gradually switching over to the high fat and dropping the protein down. Um, it's really important if you've had troubles with hunger, Ruth, to use an online food diary that's free, like MyFitnessPal. Dave hates MyFitnessPal. Um, but use some kind of way of tracking um, the percentages of fat, protein, and carbohydrates you're having. Because sometimes people think they're having high protein, but actually they're still having a lot of fat. So if you're eating streaky bacon or chicken thighs with the skin on, you're still having quite a lot of fat in there. So the protein may not be as high as you think it is. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that would be the answer. Um, don't guess how much protein, fats, and carbs you're having, actually measure it out. And MyFitnessPal is a great one. There's Chronometer, there's loads of them. So just find one of the free online food diaries, enter in what you eat. It will calculate the grams of everything you're having and you'll be able to track it quite easily. Um, so you're aiming for low carb, high fat is um, maximum 20% carbs. I um, know what I'm talking about. 10% carbs, 20% protein, 70% fat. Um, so that's what you're looking for. And they, those are called your macros. So we have micronutrients. That's, you know, all your vitamins, minerals. And then you have your macronutrients, your macros, fat, protein, carbs. Um, Lorna is saying the diet advice was rubbish on the Desmond course. <laughs> <laughs> um, the woman I was talking to today said that most people were in the 80s and just asleep at the back, but attending because they needed to be there. Um, Dave is saying the Desmond course would be a good platform for us to get our message out. We just need to hijack it. Oh, that would be so much fun. Can you imagine going in there and being Desmond course activists? And <laughs> no more carbs. Yeah, we can have some fun with that. Um, so... You, there is plenty of evidence and not just in one study and multiple studies that you can drop your blood sugars right back. It's important to realize that type 2 diabetes is carbohydrate intolerance disease. If you keep on eating carbohydrates, it's going to get worse. Uh, but, you know, as with all of it, you've got loads of people. Yeah, <laughs> you've got loads of people on here that can demonstrate what's happened to them when they've dropped the carbs. Uh, and you know, see for yourself, if you're not testing your blood sugars, invest 25 to 30 pounds, get a testing kit, test your blood sugars, and that will give you all the information you need. You're looking for sugars to stay below 7.8. That is the safe zone. Um, and if you're going above 7.8, your body isn't tolerating the food you're eating. <laughs> Tony is calling me a rebel with my placards and Dave is saying where I lead he will follow God, that would be so much fun wouldn't that be funny protest <laughs> we can protest the Desmond course oh no mm. I'm thinking now I have a few people that would be very happy to protest the course with me there's the public health collaboration which are the ones that you see all the time saying we're, we're targeting the wrong foods. So it's seen Mahultra and Sam Faltham. I know them all pretty well. They would have our back. There's quite a number of them. Zoe Harkham, she's fantastic. She's UK. Um, and a lot of, oh, we could have some real fun 
Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Poor, but we'd have to. I'd feel really sorry for the people at the Desmond course. So we'd have to maybe, um, you know, we could maybe have a um, placard somewhere else, like Desmond's head office. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, so, we, you know, all of you guys would be in line. Um, I have to think about that. I'm sure there's something that we could do that could. <laughs> that could raise awareness without getting us arrested is is the main thing um ideally not be arrested public nuisance is fine i'm good at being a public nuisance um but the arrested bit isn't so good uh so <laughs> i'll contact sam uh and see if he has any ideas he's one of the um head of the public health collaboration that's incredibly active and was in the newspapers last year because they created a new food pyramid as it actually should be um and uh and all the doctors went well no the head up poncho doctors went completely spare they didn't know what to do with themselves um so yes so we do need to get the message out but what i was talking about last week is actually this is the first time ever i think in the history of medicine really where it's the patients that are driving the change in a particular disease area. So it's you. <laughs> I feel, you know, that we need you. So it's you actually treating yourself, being your own physician, and then going to your doctor and your doctors having to take notice whether they like it or not because of what you've achieved. And that's a ripple in a pond that spreads and spreads and spreads and it does infect and inspire others. And it forces the doctors to be on their game. So you are the change. It's going from bottom up. This has never happened before. Jeff is saying, so for someone who has been told that his kidneys have been damaged by diabetes, I should aim for, yep, 10, 20, 70, 20% being protein. Yes, absolutely. There is, um, was a study that came out recently on the Atkins diet, which is quite high in protein, not dissimilar to low carb, high fat. And the findings were that it has absolutely no um, implication on the kidneys and it doesn't cause damage. There's a preliminary study that's been done in rodents, mice, um, showing that a ketogenic diet, so a ketogenic diet is a fat, excuse me, a fat burning diet. Um, so low carb, high fat, but very low carb. Um, and it was able to protect the kidneys and stop the mice from needing dialysis. So it doesn't always track to humans, but it gives us a pretty good indication. Uh, so low carb, um, high fat is, um, there is preliminary evidence that it could be protective for the kidneys. Uh, and definitely isn't going to worsen any issues that you might have. And of course, um, will stop any further damage occurring. So what happens with the kidneys is you've got this huge network of tiny, tiny blood vessels that are literally big enough for one blood cell at a time. Um, and they're filtering. So very thin walls that are filtering out um, all of the nasty stuff into the urine. Uh, now the issue comes if you get a lot of sugar running around in there, sugar is a big abrasive molecule, think sand and a hose pipe, that's running through tiny blood vessels and it starts to blow little holes in them. Now if that happens a lot when you've got high sugars, the body can't keep up with the rate of damage and can't repair. Uh, but if it happens occasionally and your blood sugars are normally below 7.8, then the body's able to cope with that. So that's why they check for protein in your urine because protein again is a big molecule and shouldn't make it through the normal holes that are in your kidneys. So if it's making it through, then they know that there's some damage there. So um, keeping the sugars down and blood pressure down is the most important to um, protect kidney function because if you've got um, lots of sand, sugar running around your bloodstream, that will cause damage, but if the sugar is at high pressure because you've got higher blood pressure then that obviously increases the damage so getting that blood pressure and the sugars down will protect your kidneys um, low carb high fat um, we think the preliminary evidence is that it's protective for kidney function as well um, yeah you guys should be guilty getting this all from me it's so funny people tell me um, sometimes 
um, that I make money from people's misery. And that's actually, it's really common. I get that really commonly. And I'm thinking, well, that's kind of every pharmaceutical company and doctor and nurse and, uh, you know, in, in, and personal trainer <laughs> in the world. You know, we're, we're trying, we're all trying, uh, you know, we might come at it from different directions, but everyone, nobody's trying to cause harm. They're all trying to help people. Sometimes they are just blind to the latest information when you guys aren't. You guys, are, uh, you're on the cutting edge. Um, so Jeffrey says, for protein, you only need one gram per kilo of lean mass of protein per day, unless you're a bodybuilder. He's absolutely right. Um, they say one to two grams per kilo uh, per day is the maximum that you need. Now, the issue with high protein, and this will be the last gem I will, because, oh gosh, I've got to go and talk to the others. Um, the issue with high protein is that the body likes to store all its energy. Um, so if extra uh, carbohydrates comes in, it converts it to fat to store it. Now, if extra protein comes in, protein is really the building blocks that's used for repair. It's not usually stored, but if you're having a lot of it, the body will store it. Now, the body doesn't convert protein to fat, it converts protein to glucose. So if you're having too much protein, it will send your blood sugars high because it's converted into glucose, not fat. So that's why we say low protein. And um, there was a study just recently in women that were overweight that were non-diabetic uh, that showed that they lost weight on a high protein diet, but it didn't improve their insulin resistance. So they were still just producing the same high levels of insulin um, after the study as they were beforehand, which is not what we'd usually expect, but it links in to the protein converting to glucose and putting pressure on the pancreas and, main, and keeping the insulin resistance going. Right, my lovely people, I'm gonna sign off there for now. Um, so lovely to have you guys all here. If you're watching this on replay, hi. If you're watching me on YouTube, leave nice messages below. Um, and I will see you guys next week. For my lovely gold members, I'll see you in a few minutes. Bye for now.